We hope you enjoy listening to this weekly podcast from Lifeline Church. You can find out more and discover our other podcasts by searching for Lifeline Church, visiting lifelinechurch.co.uk or by taking a look at our YouTube channel, Lifeline Church Dagenham. And before we get to this chapter, we've seen quite a lot of exciting stuff happening. Um, we, we've seen the church expanding rapidly. Um, Jamie talked about that last week. Many people being added to the church. We've seen people break out of prison, miraculous healings, all kinds of things. Um, but the church runs into a bit of a problem in Acts 6. And it's not the longest chapter. Um, so we're going to read through it all, first of all. And, um, and then we're going to draw some stuff out of it. So I'm just going to read through it for us. So, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Um, so a couple of longish words there that, that we might not know what they mean. Hellenistic Jews and Hebraic Jews don't have to worry about this too much, but basically there are two kind, there are two main groups in the church at this time, in, in, in the group of disciples at this time. Um, some of the Jews are, are uh, from the wider Mediterranean area, and they might have been people that came to the Passover feast and maybe encountered God and gave their lives to Jesus, became part of the church at that time. Um, and they speak Greek, and those are the Hellenistic Jews, okay? And then you've also got the local, the local Jews, those who are local to uh, Palestine. They speak Aramaic or Hebrew, um, and they're known as the Hebraic Jews. So there's a kind of cultural barrier there, right at the heart of the church, and there's a bit of a language barrier as well. We can see that this starts to cause a few challenges. So the 12 um, gathered together, all the disciples, and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, I'm not sure if this is how you really pronounce these names, but I'm going to go with it. Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we've heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So an interesting passage there. Um, obviously, we get introduced to this character of Stephen, and actually he's, he's more front and center in next week's chapter. Um, what I want to talk a bit about this morning is, we, we'll touch on Stephen, but, but looking mainly at the first part of this chapter and what happens when division arises in the church. And as I read it and prayed about what I felt God wanted, wanted to say to us this morning, I really felt there was something about serving in this, believe it or not. Um, and so I'm going to draw out three particular points about serving in the kingdom. And number one, uh, serving is an invitation to participate in a vision. Number two, 
Kingdom serving is a work of the Holy Spirit. And number three, kingdom serving is an expression of self-giving love. So, an invitation to participate in a vision. What do we, what do we mean by this? So we've seen at the start of this chapter, there's this division that has arisen in the church, and it concerns the distribution of food and resources. Because in those days, remember, if you remember back a few weeks, um, we heard about how everybody came and laid their resources at the feet of the apostles. And what happened was this was then distributed to all the people that had need. And mainly kind of um, what, what is referred to as the widows in the church, so those who could not Uh, support themselves by their own means would would be given this distribution. And the Greek, or those those Hellenistic Greek-speaking Jews that we talked about earlier, they feel that their widows are being neglected in this division. We don't know if if that was really happening. It doesn't seem to be intentional. It seems a bit of an administrative error, but nevertheless, this problem arises. But the apostles put it to the people. They say, choose seven men from among yourselves who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. And there's two things that interest me about this, about the way that they approach this. The first thing is that they invite all the people to participate in this problem. The apostles could have just, they could have just gone off into a room and said, all right, we've got this problem, what's going on? Let's look through our systems, Let, let's sort out our administration, let's make sure it doesn't happen. You know, we can put out an announcement to people and say this is what we're doing. But they don't. They actually involve the whole group of disciples in this matter. They didn't just go off and solve the problem on their own. They invited them to participate. And the second thing that really strikes me about this is the people that eventually get involved and end up uh, being appointed to serve the tables and ensure that everything is, is distributed correctly, they're all Greek Jews. So that list of names that I read, Stephen and Philip and all the rest of them, all of those names are Greek names, which is interesting because it means that actually from the group that felt hard done by, that they were being neglected, those are the ones that are getting involved and helping solve the issue. And that, that struck me because I, I kind of thought, well, well, those people could have, could have thought, well, the apostles are the experts, aren't they? They're the ones that spent their lives with Jesus um, that followed him, that heard all his wisdom, aren't they the ones that should be solving this problem? Why, why are they getting us involved? And those Greek-speaking Jews could have thought, well, actually, we're the ones that are hard done by here. We, we've, got, we've been shortchanged. We've been left out. Why are we meant to then solve this problem? Shouldn't, shouldn't that be for the apostles to do? But they didn't. They got involved. They rolled up their sleeves. They listened to the apostles, and they served, and, and they made a difference, and it solved this, this problem. And I think there's something interesting here. Um, something that threatens to derail the church and, and all that God is doing, all that God is building. You have to remember here as well that the church has an enemy, you know, and you, you could look at this as just, a, just an administrative error, something that happens um, unintended. But actually there, there is an enemy behind this who is not keen on the church expanding, that wants to sow division, that wants to breed resentment within the people. And yet something that threatens to derail the church actually becomes an opportunity for serving. What begins as a problem creates space for participation. And the reality is to be part of church, whether you're in the first century or today, we're going to encounter challenges because church involves people and people aren't perfect. And I think it's something beautifully human about this story. You know, the, the, the first century church is not this amazing, perfect, shining example that's just up there on a pedestal that we look at. It's like, wow, how can, we, how can we replicate that? It's a very human story. But I find it interesting that, that whenever we encounter a challenge, we get to choose either participation or passivity. And I want to just use a, a, an example that came to me as I was thinking about this within our own, our own community. So a number of years ago, I think just after COVID, there was a bit of a stirring amongst some of the parents um, in the church, particularly parents of young people, that there was maybe, uh, that God had something more for for their young people. COVID had caused a lot of disruption, um, and and there was just this stirring among the parents. And around about the same time, there was a challenge in that there wasn't really many youth leaders in the church. Who were, um, 
who, who were there to kind of serve, serve in the youth. And so something was born where Daniel and Heidi and a number of the other parents started uh, something called Fusion, um, which was where they got involved as parents of young people and said, actually, we want to see what God has for our young people. We want to start something that involves the parents, not just a youth program, um, but a holistic thing where the parents and the young people are serving together and pursuing family and life together. And I find that interesting because, you know, Daniel Hyde and the other parents could have just sat back and been passive and, and said, well, isn't this something for, for leaders to sort out? Where are the youth leaders? What, what are they doing? But actually something rose up within them that said, no, we have skin in the game. This is our kids. We, we want to be involved. We want to be part of the solution. And that's just one example. And you could point to so many other examples in our community where there's this choice between are we just sort of passive and sitting back and waiting for God to do something or waiting for the leaders to do something or are we leaning in and saying, God, is there something for me to do? Just another example I heard about recently where um, Elliot Baden was, was feeling that there was something among his, his friends and peers in the youth about family that God wanted to build. There was something more around family. And again, he could have just sat back and, and not done anything, but actually that led him to lead on a trip to Limitless and, and organize that among the young people, and we saw God do amazing things in that. Um, and it's not just about our community as well. We're not just creating a nice, a nice sort of huddle amongst ourselves, but it's something that spills out, something that would cause you know, Lisa Adams to look at a rundown play area in the park and think, I, I could just sit back and you know, think, why is the council not doing something about that? But actually, she lent in and said, I want to be part of the solution. Um, many, many years ago, one of the mums at the school gate noticed that, that the other mums weren't able to read to their kids and do the homework, and she could have just pointed them in the direction of the local English classes, or she could have wondered what was going to be, be happening about this, but she brought them back to her home. She chose to participate in what God had for her, and that led to the creation of Lifeline Projects. And so we see that, that where there's passivity, there's this potential for division to arise, but where we lean in and where we participate, it forces us to look beyond our differences. It breaks down barriers, makes us vulnerable, but it also enables God to work. So what gets us from passivity to participation? It, it, you know, if we're agreed that we want to be part of this, what moves us to participation? The answer is that we ask God to envision us, to give us a fresh vision of what he's doing in the church. We're not participating in an, an organization or a social club or even a movement. This is a work of God. This is his body. This is his church. And we have a glorious vision as a church. We have a mandate from God and he's captured our hearts and we're pursuing it unto eternity. And we don't get it right all the time. You know, we're not immune from mistakes in that, but we're running after something and we're doing it Together, we want to make him known in this world through loving one another, loving him, empowered by what he's done in our hearts. And as we do that, it spills out into the world as we've, as we've seen. And when we're, we're captured by that vision that God has given us, we can't just sit on the sidelines and, and observe. We have to get involved. We have to roll up our sleeves. We have to you know, get down from our, our seats and, and actually get get involved in the problem. You may have seen this um, diagram, this infographic of all the different areas to serve in the church. It's quite interesting if you haven't seen it. I think it's in the, uh, the newsletter that gets sent around. There's lots of opportunity here. You've got you know, integration team, worship team, youth ministry, children's ministry, welcome team, PA and sound. So many amazing opportunities to serve. But this isn't random, this, this diagram. This, it wasn't like the leaders just sat around and thought, how can we keep everyone busy? Let, let's think of all these different areas and skills and let, let's see what people would want to do. No, this is right now, this is how the vision that God has given us for what he has for us to be in the world and as a community is being expressed. And it's not going to always look like this. It's going to change over time. I'm sure in five years, there'll be a whole different list in that diagram. But this is the current expression of what God has for us to do. And you might look at that today and think, hmm, is there something that he has for me to do here? And I, 
I see in, in, in this story in Acts 6, you, you see a group of disciples who aren't sitting back, who are invested, who've been captured by something, captured by a vision, and they're willing to lay aside their differences, to be humble, to say, okay, I may feel like I'm hard done by, but I'm going to get involved. And you see the church increased in the process. You see unity in the process. And I think it's interesting that unity is not the same as uniformity. Unity is not about everyone thinking the same things, doing the same things, acting the same, looking the same. Unity is what happens when everybody has the same glorious vision of Jesus and then rolls up their sleeves to serve in a thousand different, different ways. And I believe that's what, that's what we begin to see in Acts. And what the enemy meant for harm, God turned for good. So the second point I want to talk about this morning from the passage is that kingdom serving is a work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been very central to the book of Acts uh, so far. It's kind of constant thread. You might even say the book of Acts is, is the story of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit in the church. It's what he's doing. It's what he's building. Um, but chapter 6 may not be as exciting as some of the other chapters. There's no prison breaks. There's no major healings, no visions. But the Holy Spirit isn't taking a break in, in chapter 6. The Holy Spirit is still very, very, very much active and at the center of things. Um, it's easy to think that this business of serving is just mundane. It's just using our skills in a natural way. But actually, it's miraculous. And I really want to emphasize this point this morning that serving with purpose and accuracy is just as miraculous as someone breaking out of prison or someone who couldn't walk jumping up and leaping around. See, the primary qualification for serving that we see in this passage is choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit. It wasn't choose seven men among you who are really, really good with numbers and, and really, really organized and you know, they can make sure that no one's missed in the distribution of food. It's men that are filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the first and primary qualification. And obviously, we, we've talked a lot recently in church about ministering the Spirit. It's something we want to see and we believe God is going to do among us, that we're going to see more of his spirit break out among us through signs and wonders and healings and prophecies and those amazing things. And it's not moving away from that. But actually, I think sometimes ministering the spirit is, is serving. You know, sometimes giving a cup of water in the name of Jesus is just as powerful as any of that stuff. I remember hearing a story of um, someone that was doing setup one morning. And um, they actually woke up, they're on the setup team, and they felt really ill. They felt rough. And they were like, do I even go to do setup today? And they, they thought, okay, I'll, I'll go along, I'll see how I go, and then I'll, I'll decide if I can carry on. And so they went and they did setup. But as they kind of went through the morning, they just felt more and more unwell and rough, and they just got to the point at the end of setup, they're like, I just can't, I just need to go home and rest. So they got in their car, they drove home, and um, they were just about to kind of rest for the morning. But then they realized that they had the Lifeline Church banner in the boot of their car, and they hadn't put it up outside the church. Now, again, they could have just thought, I'm ill, you know? Like, the Lifeline can, can live without a banner for one week. That's fine. But they thought, no, I'm just going to drive back to Mayfield. I'm going to put up the banner and then drive back home. And so they did that. And they did it very quietly. No one noticed that they did it. I don't even know if people noticed that the banner wasn't there. But that was the same morning that someone was walking past the church who'd never been before and saw the banner and thought, I'm going to go in, go in there this morning. They went into the church, and God spoke powerfully to them. I think someone can correct me on the detail of the story, but I think there was a visiting speaker that randomly this person knew from many, many years ago and, and it was just exactly what that person needed. A very simple act of, of service that easily couldn't have been done, but God used it powerfully to minister to somebody. We tend to make this spiritual, natural distinction in our lives, don't we? We tend to kind of put our lives in boxes that, you know, I'm in church or I'm, I'm ministering right now, and so I'm, I'm in the spiritual zone of my life. But, you know, if I'm taking out the bins or if I'm walking the kids to school, that, that's not spiritual. But really, there is no uh, spiritual, natural distinction in the kingdom. 
And actually the role of the seven in this story in serving is just as sacred, just as holy, just as miraculous as the preaching and the praying of the 12 apostles. Um, we, we're kind of witnessing in, in, in chapter 6, Act 6, a spiritual battle in the church that's going on. But the thing that defeats the enemy's strategy is serving. <laughs> and, and through that, we see God building the church rapidly. It says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So not only is the problem solved, but we see expansion, we see growth, we see life, we see that this responsiveness and willingness to serve is a conduit for the increase and the movement of the Holy Spirit in the church. When we're serving with humility, there's no no knowing what God will do. And again, I could point to so many examples in this community of, of where this has happened. Very simple things Um, but God used it. Um, I heard a a story recently from Jamie about um, uh, Laura Gill needed needed someone to to sit at home for when Joe arrived home from school, and she asked Ella to do it, and so so Ella kind of uh, served her in that way, but it struck up a friendship between Ella and Joe and Emily, and so she then invited them for dinner, and in the process of getting to know them, Emily was then able to serve Ella in the mums group that she was starting in in Castle Point. And so you see just a yes to serving in in that example, allow God to move and to work and actually expand the church and create more opportunity. We heard a story a number of weeks ago where Dawn stood up here and said that Fernando and Marissa had invited her and John for dinner. And somewhere in the process of them being invited for dinner, um, Dawn was able to see a bookcase in the, the next door neighbor's house that ended up being a bookcase that Lydia and John T needed and so they were able to come and collect it. And again, just a very simple act of service. God breathed his Holy Spirit on and it enabled this opportunity for the kingdom to be built, uh, for others to be blessed, others to be served. What if the task in front of you that seems so ordinary, so mundane, so simple, could be used by God to build his kingdom? What if everything we did, we did with that same sense of expectation, that same sense of reverence, saying, God, use this. I don't know how you're going to use it. I may not even see the effects, but use this. The final thing that I want to say about this, the fact that serving is empowered by the Holy Spirit is that it's not down to our own expertise or training or track record if we're submitted to him, if we're ready to say yes, no matter how scary it may seem or how ill-prepared we may feel for what it is in front of us, God says that's enough. He says that's enough. And I kind of feel like there may be people sitting here today who you maybe feel a bit disqualified from serving. Maybe you felt a stirring or you thought, oh, maybe I could do this, but I'm I'm not experienced enough. I'm just not good enough. It's not really my area. It's not for me. And God's saying, you don't need to be the world's best at this. I just need you to need me and to be filled with me and see what I can do. I, um, one of the first real opportunities I I had to get involved in serving in the church was when Jamie invited me to be a youth leader. And I so nearly did not say yes to that. Um, I've told the story many times, but I did not feel in a particularly good place to be a youth leader. I didn't feel I had the experience. I didn't feel that young people would want anything to do with me at that point in my life. And for some reason I said yes. And I know that I would not be where I am today if I had not said yes. God used that serving to expand me, to grow me, to bring increase in my life. I remember Sally gave me a prophetic word when I just started serving she said you know I can see you sitting down and young people gathering around you and they want to be around you and that just spoke to me it was was God saying it's not about you it's about what I'm doing through you and we also see that as Stephen serves in this passage particularly as the chapter moves on to look at him we see increase in his life we see new doors open new opportunities for him and it's his work and it's amazing so the final point that I want to make today as we close Um, 
Kingdom serving is an expression of self-giving love. So in the kingdom, serving is not about duty. It's not about competency. It's not about expertise. It's certainly not about recognition or status. And it's funny how, you know, in the world, serving is always about those things to some degree. It, it, It always reflects back on us somehow. It's always about getting a sense of recognition or a pat on the back. It's impossible to escape that outside of, outside of the kingdom. But in the kingdom, it's not. It's always about love. And the greatest expression of love, as we know, is to lay down one's life for one's friends. And the seven chosen to serve in, in, in Act 6... They weren't serving a system, they weren't serving a function, they were serving a family. Their, their motivation was love for their family. And, and, and just as we think about our community as well, and we, we think about the many opportunities there are to serve amongst us, again, we're not just slotting our skills into a system, into a framework, and it's like, okay, I, I slot in here because I'm good at this, or I'm good at this. It's responding to a need, it's catching that vision, It's loving one another. And we see the central character, really, of this chapter. And again, next week, chapter 7, we we really get to zoom in on on this man, Stephen, and and learn more about him. Um, But he's a Greek believer. And the name Stephen is actually from the Greek word Stephanos, which I looked up on Wikipedia. Um, So we know it can be trusted. Um, (laughs) And it it actually means wreath, crown, and by extension, reward, honor, renown, and fame. And I find that really interesting because it's kind of actually the opposite of what what I see expressed in the character of Stephen. I actually see humility in this man um, who who rolls up his sleeve, who gets involved, and, and serves in this way. You know, Stephen could have complained when asked to to serve tables, it's quite a sort of lowly task in a way. It's quite a a simple task in a way. He could have said, you know, we we see later on in the chapter that Stephen's involved in preaching and working amazing miracles and things like that. And he could have said, you know what, actually, I I kind of feel like I've got a growing preaching ministry and and, a miracle ministry. I I don't really think serving tables is is for me. Just give me space to kind of do my thing and you'll see what, what I mean. But he doesn't say that. He has a heart to serve. He gets involved. Mother Teresa said, in this life, we cannot always do great things, but we can do small things with great love. I love that quote. Serving is not about status, but it's about sacrifice. It's not about what is seen, but it's about what's not seen. One of the most powerful stories of serving that I've ever witnessed. (laughs) Um, I was 14 years old. Many of you know I grew up in this church, and I was part of the youth at the time. Um, and the church van had been graffitied overnight. Um, And a number of the youth were kind of, someone was coordinating, saying, right, let's get a group of young people to get together. Ken Jarvis is going to be at Castle Point on Saturday morning, cleaning the graffiti off the church van. Let's see how many young people we can get to go and help him out. And that was really not what I wanted to spend my Saturday morning doing. It was in the winter. It was cold. Um, I didn't want to be cleaning graffiti off the church van, but I just went along and said yes to this. And and as I was kind of waiting outside Castle Point for all the other youth to arrive, um, it gradually dawned on me that actually no one else was coming, (laughs) Um, that it it was just me and and Ken Jarvis cleaning graffiti off, off the church van. And you know what? Like Some tasks are actually quite satisfying. If you're cleaning something, you can see the impact of what you're doing You can see you're making progress. This was not one of those tasks. Um, Cleaning graffiti is incredibly difficult. Um, We were using water from the taps. The water was freezing. My hands were like just freezing cold. I could barely move them. But we were there scrubbing this graffiti that didn't seem to be coming off. And somewhere in, in that process of doing that, it dawned on me. It was like, if I had just decided not to come this morning, Ken Jarvis still would have been there. He still would have been cleaning that graffiti. 
the, the van would have been cleaned and nobody would have known that he did it. It, just, it was just so powerful in my mind. It was like, oh my goodness, if I wasn't here, it still would have been done. You know, it was graffitied on Friday night. It would have been cleaned by, by midday Saturday. No one would have even known that it was a problem. And yet there he was doing it. Um, that always stuck with me as just an example of, of what serving looks like. It's not about what is seen, but what is unseen. See, the world seeks recognition for serving. It seeks that crown, if you like, that Stephanos. Um, but what do we see in the book of Revelation? At the end of the age, we see the true saints taking off their crowns and throwing them down at the feet of Jesus. And actually, we're not going to get into it fully this week, um, but we, we see that Stephen is, is not only willing to serve in, in this very literal way, but he also eventually is willing to give his life for the sake of the gospel. And it's a powerful picture of what it means to not seek a crown in our lives through what we do, but actually lay it down at the feet of Jesus. So how do we do this? What empowers us to cast our crown at the feet of Jesus? It's the fact that we have a saviour, a king, who first removed his crown and came down to serve us. It says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He swapped his crown of unimaginable glory with the Father for a crown of thorns. And there's a passage here in, in Philippians which I want to read because it's just so powerful. It's one of my favorite passages. And it says this. So if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And here's the key bit. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And he goes on to talk about how God has raised him to the highest point of honour so that every knee would bow at the name of Jesus. This was a king who, before he died, got down on his hands and knees and washed the feet of his disciples, the most lowly, humiliating, degrading job that there, there was at that time. He not only washed the feet of his friends, he washed the feet of the man who was going to betray him. He washed the feet of Judas, who, hours later, would hand him over to the authorities to be killed. This is the king we serve. And he went to the cross and gave his life so that that selfishness and pride, which is so natural in us, that we can't escape outside of him, could be defeated. That, that same pride that would seek us to avoid the menial jobs, that would cause us to, to want to avoid serving and, and want to reflect back on ourselves. And it's this, this line which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In him, as we surrender to him, as we kneel before him, as we say, Jesus, we cannot do this on our own. Change me. Renew my mind. Give me that same mind that you had. He does something miraculous in us, and he empowers us to live his way. And this, I believe, is the same example we see in Stephen at the end of the chapter and that we see next week in chapter 7 as well. It's a man with the same servant heart of Jesus, who's willing to risk persecution for the sake of that good news of the gospel expanding. So, I'm going to finish there. Just a couple of questions to ponder um, that you might want to take away with you. 
you might want to come and respond at the end uh, this morning. But the first one is, is there an opportunity for us to move from passivity to participation? And remember, it comes from that fresh vision. So maybe it's coming to God and saying, God, I feel like I've, I've just lost a bit of that vision that I once had for your people, your community, what you're doing, what you're doing in me. I want to step in. I want to lean in. I want to be a part of what you're doing in this world. Number two is, I kind of believe that there might be people here this morning who God wants to release you into serving. Maybe there's chains holding you back. You're feeling you're not good enough. Um, You're feeling that you're not able to. You're feeling that you might step out and, and fall flat on your face. And God's saying, I just need you to need me. Um, It's not by strength nor might, but by the Spirit of God that we do this. And uh, I just feel there might be a release for some people as well. And then finally, um, I want to be empowered to love out of the love that he's shown me. Jesus, I want to kneel before you. I want to take off my crown. I want to lay at your feet with that example that you've given me. And um, and I want to be empowered to have that same mind that you had. Thank you for listening to this podcast by Lifeline Church. We hope this message has been an encouragement to you. We are a relational church who live to demonstrate God's love to one another and our surrounding community in real and practical ways. We believe that this love can restore our families, our friendships, our communities and our nation. We'd love to connect further with you, so please visit our website, lifelinechurch.co.uk or interact with us on Facebook at lifeline.church.uk.